The 2020-2021 season of Nat Talks is made possible by presenting sponsor, the Downing Family Foundation and media partner, KPBS, the public media stations serving San Diego and Imperial counties. We are very excited for tonight's speaker. Like I said, he's a good friend of the Nat who we love to invite back whenever we have the opportunity. Ecologist Dr. James Hung was born in Taiwan and grew up in Vancouver, Canada. He received his bachelor's degree from Dartmouth College and his PhD from UC San Diego, where he studied native bee diversity and conservation in San Diego's endangered coastal sage scrub ecosystem. He currently lives in Toronto, Canada with his wife and they have two small children as he studies apple pollination as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto. Now in July, he'll be joining the faculty of the University of Oklahoma as a pollination ecologist. In his spare time, James enjoys being outdoors with his kids, making food with his wife, and playing the violin in his church band. Welcome, James. Nice to have you with us. All right, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Justin. And thank you so much, everyone, for having me here. Um, I've been a, a big admirer of the work at the museum for a long time now. So I'm really, really excited to be here today to share with you some of what I've learned about San Diego bees over the last decade. Um, and Justin and Emma, if, you, if um, I'm speaking too fast or if there's any technical difficulties, um, please do chime in and let me know. All right. So um, onward towards our program. Um, and before I uh, get started, I should mention that if you see photos on the screen that do not have a copyright mark, um, they're my own photos uh, and I'm choosing to leave them out because it feels like spamming to attach my name to all these photos that I'm showing. Okay, so I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about myself. I was born in Taiwan, um, as Justin mentioned, um, which has a very strict education system, at least when I was growing up. And so as someone who struggled with ADHD, I started having issues with schooling starting in pre-kindergarten. Um, and I would get spankies and get put in the corner pretty much every day. But thankfully, my mom had me transferred to a different teacher uh, who recognized that I wasn't just this bad kid who loved to make trouble, um, just had a hard time staying focused and engaged indoors in a very structured system. And so this teacher sent me out to the schoolyard to follow ants and butterflies and dragonflies and to report back to her about what I observed about these insects' natural history. And so a tiny entomologist was born. And I spent the rest of my years in Taiwan catching and observing insects whenever I got the chance. And when I moved to Canada at age 10, I did my best to continue studying insects, even when we went on family vacations. And I roped in my younger brother, who is now an inventor, uh, to be my first field assistant. And I also enlisted my parents to be my first research sponsors. So here's uh, my brother um, holding a Maclay's Spectre that, uh, that he and I raised in the basement that my parents let us convert into an insect rearing laboratory. After high school, I went to college in New Hampshire, which is, you know, not famous for uh, amazing insect diversity, but I did get to keep studying insects um, through taking a bunch of really excellent courses, including a field course that took place in Costa Rica, where these photos were taken. Afterwards, um, as you know, I pursued my PhD at UC San Diego and then postdoc at Ohio State University to study how to balance pest control with um, pollinator protection on uh, pumpkin farms. And now I'm finishing up my second postdoc studying apple pollination. And well, since COVID started, I'm mostly just, you know, eking out the lockdown here with my wife, Susan, and my two kids, Ninja and Gracie. Okay, with the introduction, the self-introduction done, let's open our discussion of bees with this question. Where do plants come from? Now, this isn't a trick question. And we all know that most plants grow up from seeds. And in order for plants to produce seeds, they need to combine genetic material from a father and a mother, just like in animals. Now, one feature about plants is that they're rooted in space and they can't move. So how do they go about exchanging genetic information with another individual that's far away? Well, they need a system that includes a mobile component. And that component is pollen, which is the male gametophyte of the plant. 
So here is an electron microscope image of pollen from several different plant species at 500 times magnification, where you can see that there are different shapes and sizes that are unique to each species. Pollen grains are produced by specialized structures in the plant's flowers, and their goal in life is to get to another flower um, and uh, germinate in the receptive structure and fertilize the egg cell, which then develops into a seed. Now, how does pollen get from one plant to another? Well, many plant species are pollinated by the wind, like our familiar lawn grasses and corn and ragweeds, as well as many trees. Wind pollinated plants are actually the cause of hay fever, as many of you who suffer from uh, this condition know. Um, and hay fever is just windborne pollen trying to fertilize your nose and your eyes and making your body freak out at this unwanted advance from plants. Now, dispensing pollen via the wind can be very inefficient and wasteful. So wind pollinated plants need to make lots and lots of it. And here's a photo of a layer of tree pollen on a poor dude's car windshield and uh, how the guy feels about his situation. Um, you can imagine that if all plants did this, there will be so much pollen everywhere, right? So thankfully, most plant species are not wind pollinated. Instead, the majority of plants, about 85% of the known plant species, depend on animals to some extent to exchange their pollen. And so reproduction for plants is literally about the birds and the bees and the flies and beetles and butterflies and moths and bats. Now, all these very different looking um, animals have many features in common that make them great pollinators. Um, they all have in common excellent mobility. These are all strong flyers. They also have strong sensory ability that allows them to detect the presence and identity of flowers uh, in a wide landscape. And they also have a strong reliance on flowers as a source of their food. This last point, the reliance on flowers for food, uh, illustrates the fact that pollination relationships between animals and plants are more of a mutual exploitation rather than a harmonious partnership that many of us uh, grew up thinking about. Because pollinators are always trying to get the most food from flowers while putting in the least amount of work, uh, whereas plants are always trying to pay the pollinators the least amount of pollen and nectar to hire them to do the pollination work for them. But in general, um, this balance of the two sides tends to work out in this free and unregulated market system and a tremendous amount of biodiversity can be sustained through these selfish partnerships. And in such a system, there can be pretty heavy competition between plants and pollen, uh, between plants for the service of pollinators. And so they invest a lot of resources to advertise their flowers. So whereas we humans think about uh, reproductive organs as private parts, for plants, they're just the opposite, as you can see from these eight plant species from the deserts of San Diego. Now, this huge diversity uh, in flowers in terms of their shapes, their colors, and their smells uh, to attract very different kinds of pollinators has been extensively studied and covered in lots of books and research papers and dissertations. So I won't go into this topic in detail today. Uh, instead, as advertised, I'm going to focus on bees, which are the chief pollinators in our region and also in many other places in the world. The first step to learning more about bees is learning how to recognize one. So I'm going to give a super quick bee recognition 101 here. So first, bees are often very fuzzy. In fact, uh, one of the defining characteristics <clears throat> for us taxonomists is that bees have branched hairs somewhere on their body. Bees have thin waists and also flattened hind legs that often are equipped with a dense brush of bristles for carrying pollen. They have wings that are usually carried flat and overlapping over their backs while they're at rest. They have elbowed and rod-like antennae, large but not bugged out eyes, and often but not always, uh, striking patterns of stripes on their abdomens made up of bands of hair or different color patches of exoskeleton. Now, since bees are classified by biologists as a group of very specialized vegetarian wasps, it makes sense that the insects that they're most often confused for are wasps. Wasps have similar antennae, similar narrow waists, and often the same kinds of contrasting bright and dark colors, but their hind legs are not flattened. Their wings are usually held in an angle on the back and folded. Their bodies are usually considerably less hairy and if you see um, an insect hunting another insect, as you see here, that's a dead giveaway that it can't be a bee because bees never hunt prey. 
Now here is a hoverfly that looks a lot like a bee. Um, however, despite being colored similar to a bee uh, for its own protection, you can recognize it by its bugged out eyes, short stubby antennae, thin wimpy legs, and wings that are held in a plane while the insect is at rest. And also flies only have two wings while bees and wasps have four. But who's counting when the insects are in flight, right? Now, not all bees will display all, all of the typical features that I just discussed, like these two bees here. Um, and also many non-insects, uh, non-bee insects will have features that are similar to bees, again, for their own defense, because you know, bees are known to sting, uh, like this hoverfly here with its striped abdomen and folded wings over its back. So please take my bee recognition 101 with just a grain of salt, because it takes even trained biologists some practice to be able to consistently correctly identify an insect as a bee, uh, because bees are so highly diverse. Speaking of diverse bees, San Diego is a global hotspot of bee biodiversity. Of the roughly 20,000 known bee species in the world, about 700 of them can be found here in San Diego County, as my work in collaboration with uh, Michael Wall and Jim Berrien at the museum has shown. Which means that at about 0.002% of the world's land area, we have over 3% of the world's bee biodiversity. So that's hugely disproportionate. For reference, we have more bee species than pretty much every state east of Texas and also every state north of Utah, which also means that we have more bee species than the majority of, um, of small countries our size around the world. One reason that we have such high bee diversity is that we have a lot of plant diversity in our county and also elevational diversity and climatic diversity all crammed in a close proximity to, to one another as we can see from this map. Uh, we're also at the interchange of a temperate North American biome and a tropical Central American biome, which brings together bees from lots of different lineages all into our little area. So here are 16 native bees from our county, from the coast to the desert, to help you literally put some faces to the stats that I mentioned, and to give you an idea of the incredible variation that exists in this group. We'll be spending the next few minutes on a brief overview of how our different bee species live their lives. But before that, I'd like to pause and quickly talk about this insect here, which is, as you probably recognize, the Western honeybee. This is the one that people uh, tend to think about when they hear the word bee. As you know, as well, they live in huge colonies that are headed by a single queen. They work hard all the time uh, to make and store lots and lots of honey in their honeycombs, and they aggressively defend um, this honey with very painful stings. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this uh, insect because it is in fact not a native bee to North America. It was introduced as a sort of livestock by some of the first European settlers. Now in San Diego, we see honeybees everywhere um, because they have escaped from our management and established, you know, feral populations all over the place. Uh, I'll be returning this, uh, to this topic a little bit later, so hold that thought. For now, I'm going to move ahead uh, to our discussion of native bees by presenting some potentially surprising facts. So 90% of bees don't make honey. Uh, so more than 90% of the bees don't make honey. 90% of the bees are not social. More than half of the bees out there can't sting. And 13% of the bees don't work hard and make an honest living. Wow. Most bees out there don't really conform to our expectation of how bees ought to live, right? Well, for the majority of bee species, their life cycle goes like this. A female bee collects pollen and nectar from flowers and deposits uh, the collected pollen and nectar in nest cells that she excavates underground. And once she collects enough, she forms a provision ball and lays an egg on it. Meanwhile, the male bees are, well, not really doing much other than flying around and chasing females. I mean, they only have half the amount of DNA that females have, so I think we can cut them some slack, right? Anyway, when the egg hatches, the baby bee, called a larva, gets to live one of the cushiest lives of any animal out there. You can see that it has no external body parts that are needed for survival because it is born in a safe, sealed chamber on top of a giant comfy food pillow that contains all the nutrients it needs to grow up healthy and strong. After eating this food pillow, the bee larva goes uh, through uh, metamorphosis into a pupa stage, just like butterflies. 
And then it emerges as an adult the following year um, when the time is right and the process repeats itself again. Now, what time is the right time for this emergence? Well, it depends on the bee species. Many of our bee species are pollen specialists, which means they will only provision their nests with pollen from one family or even one genus of plant. Uh, in these cases, then, the bee's emergence time is usually very closely tied to the blooming times of their host plants. So for example, this microdigger bee will only collect pollen from indigo bushes and smoke trees and can only be found when these species are in bloom in the desert. And here is Fuchsus evening bee, which is a specialist on sun cups in the evening primrose family. And so they can only be found, be found early in the spring when these flowers are in bloom. Here's a turret bee that only collects pollen from cactus. So cactus has a slightly longer blooming period. So these bees also have a slightly longer flight period. Um, now, why is it called a turret bee? It's because they build these little turrets around their nest entrances, presumably because um, they're, they're using them to defend against parasitic bee flies that shoot eggs into their nests. And yes, you heard right. There are parasitic flies that literally shoot eggs into the nests of these bees. So you can imagine how having a turret can foil the fly's attempts. Um, I like to give a big thanks to my friend James Carey for sharing this very incredible footage. I had never seen this happen in the wild until my, my friend shared uh, this footage with me. Uh, there are pollen specialist bees on all kinds of plant species, including rather uncommon plants like this uh, Mustang mint. So you can imagine that these pollen specialist bees would also themselves be pretty rare like these zone Caliopsis bees. Ground nesting specialist bees also include one of the smallest bees in North America, and actually also one of the tiniest in the world, the Euphorb mini fairy bee, which is a specialist on sand mat flowers. So if you know how tiny sand mat flowers are, you have a good idea of how small this bee is. And if you don't, here's good old Abe Lincoln for scale, where you can see that the bee is only a little bit longer than two penny letters in length. Given that specialist bees completely depend on the pollen of their host plants, one would assume that they would be the best high fidelity pollinator for their hosts, right? Well, actually not always. So here's a current minor bee, which as its name implies, will forage only on current pollen. And here it is doing its thing, foraging on fuchsia flower current, which has long tubular red flowers that are actually primarily pollinated by hummingbirds. So here's one concrete example where pollinators are just out after their own interests and don't really care what kind of service they're rendering to their host plants in return. Another assumption people might make about pollen specialist bees is that they're not really relevant to the average person um, because they only associate with a narrow set of plant species. However, some specialists can be very economically important when they associate with crop plants like this squash bee here that is responsible for a huge chunk of squash and pumpkin production here in North America. All right, I just showed you a bunch of specialist bees just now. Uh, and indeed, specialists make up a large portion of the bee diversity in our region. But the majority of bee species in the world are actually pollen generalists, which means um, they're able to forage for pollen from many different kinds of plant species. Here's a generalist, the striped sweat bee, uh, that looks incredibly exotic with her bright metallic green color, but it's actually one of our most common bee species in San Diego. Now striped bees, um, striped sweat bees have a special place in my heart because uh, one of the species is the official bee of the city of Toronto where I live right now. Um, and that's because these bees live in condos like most Torontonians, including me. What this means is that several females will share a nest tunnel um, and they'll build their own subdivisions of nest cells um, branching off the main tunnel shaft. And then they take turns serving as the concierge of the condo to guard the nest against intruders. So, you know, really collaborative, heartwarming stuff um, that apparently uh, very much characterizes a uh, Torontonian lifestyle. Here's the last ground nesting bee I'm gonna show you today um, in this section, a uh, polyester bee or a cellophane bee. The name comes from the fact that it lines its nest with a waterproof secretion uh, that it makes that is similar to cellophane. And using this uh, secretion, it deposits a soupy pollen nectar slurry instead of a, of a solid pollen ball. So one interesting fact about the polyester bee uh, and their relatives is that this soupy pollen nectar slurry 
will ferment and start bubbling and develop uh, a, a yeasty smell. Um, and this observation has inspired scientists to hypothesize and then finally uh, go on to demonstrate that bees are actually deriving a lot of their nutrition from the microbes that colonize their provisions. So this means that bee provisions are kind of a value added product, kind of like kombucha or kimchi or sauerkraut. Um, and this makes bees some of the earliest brewers. And it puts them a little bit closer to microbe eaters rather than strict vegetarians. Among the bees that don't excavate nests underground, most of them uh, nest in wood. Some bees like carpenter bees can carve their own tunnels into the wood, but most of them use existing cavities that are left behind by beetles and other critters, or in the case of this picture, uh, by human researchers. Since these bees don't construct their own homes, but rather rent pre-existing spaces, they have to bring in their own furniture to make this place comfy and hospitable. Uh, so some species will cut leaves and flower petals to surround and protect their pollen balls and their babies. Um, others will scrape plant hairs uh, to make a fuzzy fabric of sorts, um, kind of like a pillow cover. And still others will use mud or plant resin. So even though these bees don't have to labor to excavate long tunnels underground, they do have to spend a considerable amount of time scrounging around for nest building materials. Here's one of the wood tunnel renters, a leafcutter bee. It belongs in the family Megachylidae, uh, whose family members collect pollen using pollen brushes on the underside of their abdomens rather than um, brushes on their hind legs. So I like to say that in the world of bees, it's the ladies who have hairier legs or hairier bellies. Here's another wood tunnel renter, a masked bee, which is a member of the polyester bee family. So you can see that this bee is not very hairy and doesn't have a pollen brush anywhere on its body. And that's because it is unique among our bees in that they carry pollen by swallowing it and then spitting it back out on their nest rather than outside of, outside of their bodies. So this characteristic has made it pretty difficult to study uh, the habits of, nest, uh, of these masked bees because you can't just grab one off a flower and swap out the pollen that it's carrying uh, and see what it's packing. So a lot, a lot more to be learned about these little guys. As I mentioned earlier, carpenter bees um, can drill their own holes in wood. So this large carpenter bee that's about uh, the size of a grape um, can drill holes that are, I guess, about the diameter of a, of a thick marker. So because of this habit, they can sometimes become pests when they make their homes in our outdoor wooden structures. This strong chewing ability also makes them pests to some plants as well uh, because they chew holes in these long tubular bird pollinated flowers and they rob the nectar that they normally can't um, access by a legitimate means like this one is doing here. So this again demonstrates the utilitarian and selfish nature of the relationship between plants and their pollinators. Here's um, just for fun, a carpenter bee nest showing the cushy lives of the bee larvae. You can tell by the size of the larvae that the cells were made from left to right you can also clearly see the dividers that the bees made by gluing together sawdust from the excavation. So here's a fact of the day for all you DIY nerds out there. Carpenter bees are the real inventors of the particle board. Here's a close relative of the large carpenter bee, the aptly named small carpenter bee that excavates small stems for their nests. One interesting fact about this group that I had just learned recently is that some species have a system where the mother bee will raise a dwarf daughter as her first offspring, and then uh, make this dwarf daughter forage for food for her younger siblings. Now this poor eldest daughter will spend her whole life working. So it's like a real life Cinderella story, except the prince never shows up. Uh, before you get too sad for this uh, eldest daughter though, I should tell you that all her hard work is instrumental to her little siblings survival. And so even though she sacrifices her own reproduction, she does get to pass on her genes through her siblings, which um, she can share 75% of her DNA with because um, the way B genders and DNA is, is determined, um, male bees have to pass on 100% of their DNA in every sperm cell. So siblings among bees are more similar to siblings among um, most other animals. In fact, this DNA sharing um, this increase in DNA sharing between siblings is one of the proposed reasons that so many bees and wasps are social. So I mentioned that social living is a relatively rare trait among bees, 
but still about you know one in ten species live social lives where a queen bee lays eggs and the worker bees forage and maintain uh, their nest uh, and forego their own reproduction. Bumblebees are probably the most familiar of our social bees. Here you can see that like honeybees, they build wax containers to store nectar that they collect. But unlike honeybees, it's a pretty messy, not standardized affair for these bumblebees. Bumblebee colonies are also much, much smaller, usually with just dozens to hundreds of workers compared to tens of thousands of workers in honeybee colonies. And also bumblebee colonies are annual, which means that only newborn queens will survive through the winter and they have to build everything from scratch the following year. Besides bumblebees and the small carpenter debris I mentioned before, our only other social bees are all sweat bees, like this tiny metallic sweat bee, which true to its name, uh, this one is licking sweat off of my finger, which presumably provides them with the minerals that they need. Our other common green bee, the peridot sweat bee, is also a social species. All right, on to our next fact. More than half of the bees out there can't sting. Now, one reason is that there's a bee tribe called the Meloponini, where all 500 or so species lack stingers. Um, these only live in the tropics though, so we don't have any here in California, except for a small population in the Bay Area that descended from Brazilian colonies that escaped from a Stanford researcher's lab back in the 1950s. Um, so these that I'm picturing here are trigona bees that I photographed on a trip to Costa Rica. The other more important reason so many bees can't sting is that about half of the bees uh, out there are males. Bee stingers are actually modified egg-laying organs, and since males don't have that organ, they can't sting. I should also mention that even though females of most species um, possess stingers, uh, they won't sting you unless you actively harass them or try to pick them up or squish them. So you really don't need to be skittish around bees when they're working. You know, they just want to go about their day collecting nectar and pollen, either for their little siblings or for their uh, offspring. Um, they do not want to get into tussles with giant, bipedal, warm-blooded monsters like us. Okay, next, what's this fact about not working hard and uh, living honestly all about? How do bees provide for their babies if they don't work hard to make nests and gather pollen? The answer is, they invade the nest of a different bee species and deposit their own eggs on or near the pollen provision. And when their baby hatches, um, it eats the host bee's egg or larva and takes over the pollen ball. So bees with this lifestyle are called kleptoparasites. And if this lifestyle sounds familiar to you, it's probably because you've heard it before in cuckoo birds. So you won't be surprised to hear that kleptoparasitic bees are commonly known as cuckoo bees. Cuckoo bees come from a number of different lineages across three different bee families, and they are a diverse component of our bee fauna in San Diego and around the world. Around one in eight bee species are cuckoo bees worldwide. Now, despite this varied background, I feel like they all kind of look evil and wasp-like. I mean, doesn't this cuckoo bee here just look like she's plotting something? Here's another cuckoo bee where you can see that she indeed does not have any pollen collecting hairs. One might think that this nomadic marauding lifestyle is carefree and easy living, but you'd be wrong because it really limits you to living only where your host bees are found in great abundance. And also it's only a matter of time before you bump into the host bee in her, uh, in her nest and get roughed up like this morning bee that's being forcefully escorted from the premises by its digger bee host. Such violent encounters might explain why this morning bee I saw in the desert was missing both of her antennae. Okay, I'm going to conclude the bee diversity portion of this talk for now, uh, because it'll take all day uh, to show you all the amazing diversity and lifestyles of the bees we have here. Um, so hopefully this will just be a, a nice sneak preview for you all, and you'll get the opportunity to go and enjoy many, many native bees in the wild, wherever you are. Uh, for most of us coming from coastal San Diego, um, we're near the tail end of the best season for bee watching around the coast. But there's still plenty of plants that are just getting ready to bloom up in the mountains like Palomar and Cuyamaca Rancho. Basically, 
Wherever there are large expanses of natural habitat and lots of blooming native flowers, you can expect there to be native bees hard at work. And now that you know how to recognize a bee and how they make a living, I hope you'll take the opportunity to go and do some bee watching next time you're out. Now, I wish I could tell you that you can enjoy a great diversity and abundance of bees anywhere you go, but that simply won't be true because much of the world and San Diego's beautiful natural habitats have been converted to human development. In fact, if you recall this vegetation map of San Diego I showed you earlier, one of the most prominent kinds of land cover is urban development, here depicted in gray. This loss of natural habitat is the primary driver of biodiversity loss around the world, and it's the same for biodiversity of San Diego's native bees. A big part of my PhD thesis looked at what happens to bee communities when you cut up their habitat into small patches, like what we have in coastal San Diego. We found that when we compared similarly sized study plots in large unfragmented natural reserves and small fragments of scrub that are embedded in the urban landscape, and also the urban landscape itself, there were about 75 bee species in these plots and reserves, 50 species in fragments, and less than 10 bee species um, in the urban landscape. Sorry, that should be less than, I just noticed it. I've given this talk several times and uh, just noticed that that says greater than, I actually meant less than 10 species in the urban landscape. Um, this demonstrates that simply preserving habitat is not good enough. What we need to do is preserve large unfragmented habitat that's relatively free from the influence of the surrounding urban landscape. So light pollution, chemical pollution, invasive species, um, and all of that. Um, but really any habitat preserved is still much better than no habitat preserved. And so we should continue to carefully steward whatever patchwork of habitat fragments and remnants and canyons that are still left. Um, so as Justin mentioned earlier, um, the work um, for of conservation in the canyon lands of San Diego, I think is something very, very important to be doing. Another big threat to biodiversity worldwide is climate change. We've all heard about global warming, but that's just one aspect of climate change. In fact, extreme climate events and increased climate fluctuations are also um, very important aspects of this uh, source of disturbance. And here in San Diego, one of the most harmful examples of this aspect is drought. And as you can guess, when everything is dry and no flowers are in bloom, bees can suffer as well. In our studies, we found that bees are kind of resilient and they do bounce back once the drought has ended, but the drought still did cause a nearly 30% reduction in bee diversity, um, at least in the short term that we study. However, we still don't really have a good idea of what's exactly happening to bees during the drought itself when no flowers are in bloom. We also don't know what the long-term effects of drought on bee diversity is. So there's still a lot of room for study. Um, but I think the data that we do have on hand um, that we published earlier this year um, do tell us that climate change is a threat that could be just as serious as habitat loss. So we need to keep an eye, keep an eye on this uh, stressor that really could potentially keep getting worse and worse and worse with time unless we really take action to ameliorate um, the impacts we have on the climate. Another threat, believe it or not, is honeybees. Honeybees have been running wild in California since the mid 1800s. And in the recent decades, their populations have further increased with infusion of genes from African populations, which are even better adapted to the hot climate that we have here. Um, honeybees, as you know, are prodigious eaters, um, storing up all that honey. And researchers have estimated that a single honeybee colony could consume the same amount of resources that could go on to feed 30,000 solitary bees every single month. My own research also shows that here in San Diego, honeybees are taking the lion's share of the food that's available to the pollinators. On this figure, the light orange portion of each bar is honeybees. The dark green portion is native pollinators, which uh, includes but are not limited to native bees. And these bars are arranged from left to right according to how abundant the flowering species is in the environment. So the bars on the left here would be say a lone shooting star plant growing by itself. Um, the bar on the right would be something like 
uh, a whole hillside of California buckwheat all blooming at the same time. So as you can see, the orange portion gets bigger and bigger as the plant species in question gets more and more dominant in the landscape, which means that honeybees are disproportionately abundant on the plant species that provide the majority of flowers in a given area. And if you express the same data uh, in raw numbers instead of the percentages I show on this graph, you get this kind of pattern, which shows you just how staggeringly abundant honeybees are and just how much resources they are hogging to themselves in our uh, California coastal sage scrub. So what effect this has on local pollinators and plants is something that we still desperately need to study. So why should we care about the plight that our native bees are facing, especially since honeybees are so common and um, are so good at you know, pollinating so many different plant species? Well, there are definitely plants out there that honeybees can't or won't pollinate. Uh, and we really need other bee species for those. So just for a few examples, some lupines are too heavy for honeybees to operate. So they require large beefy bees like this bumblebee to properly pollinate. Nightshades and their relatives like tomatoes need buzz pollination, which many of our native bees do very well, especially bumblebees. Uh, but honeybees really can't do this very well. There are things like cryptanthas uh, and relatives that have tiny floral openings that require bees with specialized hairs to effectively get pollen out and move it around. And a final example, Primaria. This is an oil producing species um, that makes oil instead of nectar. So only the oil collecting centric species uh, are likely to visit this plant often. And even if you're not one of those more specialized plants, it may be still important that there's a diverse community of bees around to service you. So for example, even generalist bees that theoretically can forage on any flower in the environment may have their own distinct preferences. And different bees may also prefer to pollinate under different kinds of environmental conditions. And they could have activity periods at different times of the year. And even two bee species that pollinate the same plant at the same time may be pollinating different parts of the same plant, either flowers growing at different heights or different parts of even a single flower. And these things I talk about aren't just theoretical. If you're a fruit grower, you can actually see the consequences of not having enough pollinators in real life with these misshapen shriveled up strawberries. They don't look very yummy to eat. And in the natural world, sustained declines of pollinators will almost certainly lead to the loss of plant diversity. And perhaps in the worst case scenario, it could ultimately result in landscapes becoming taken over by wind pollinated or clonally reproducing species like grasses and fennels that don't need um, to be pollinated by insects. So hopefully I've convinced you that we should care about and learn more about our native bee species. Now you may be wondering uh, what you can do to help the bees if you're not a biologist or a land manager or a funding agency but there are actually quite a few things that anyone can do that will be very helpful in our effort to conserve native bees. And as my talk title suggests, I'm gonna share a few of them with you today. One excellent way is to go out and photograph bees and upload them to community science platforms online like iNaturalist, which can help biologists keep track of bee populations in ways that we never could before, um, before the internet and uh, digital photography. So we biologists can't monitor bees every day and be everywhere at once, and there's a very limited number of us. But if community members like yourselves can take photos of bees whenever you encounter them, um, these records can really help us fill in the gaps and get a better grasp of what bees are active at what times of the year and what places. Uh, specifically, there are a few reasons that I and my collaborators have particularly high hopes for this kind of data. So first I'm gonna show you this map for the third time today to remind us of where our developed areas are. Um, and then here are heat maps of records from iNaturalist, uh, the community science platform versus museum records that have been digitized and available online. And you can see that iNaturalist records have a much better coverage of the urban areas. And this makes sense 
since we biologists can get permits to go and survey bees in natural areas, you know, Antaparego, no problem, Cuyamaca, no problem. Um, but we really can't get permits to just go into people's yards and look for bees there. Um, but each one of you can keep track of bees that show up in your own yards and in your own neighborhoods, which will be a huge help to us. And second, compared to museum records, com community members who use INAT are submitting more and more records every year. Um, so the growth potential is enormous. I mean, if you look at this, you know, it really only started taking off in 2015 um, and the growth has been exponential so far. We expect that this gap between data contributed by community science and museum collections will actually become even more pronounced in the future as permits become harder and harder to get, um, as conservation efforts become more serious for insects, which, you know, could be a good thing. But also uh, the other reason is funding for biological collections and biodiversity inventories is still uh, becoming more and more limited, which is definitely a bad thing. Third, iNaturalist users are documenting bees more evenly across the months of the year, rather than just doing the peak bloom periods like biologists tend to do. I'm very guilty of that because I need to write papers and TA classes um, in, the, in the off season. Um, so this more even representation uh, around the year gives us a better picture, a more complete picture of what the year round bee profile looks like. And all of these properties could make iNaturalist um, and other community science platforms um, an especially powerful tool for monitoring bees um, as they respond to contemporary pressures like urban development, climate change, extreme climate events like drought that I talked about earlier. And one final reason, um, records contributed by the general public can be useful for more than just tracking rare species. They can also be useful in tracking important phenomena like this amazing turret bee nesting aggregation where a tiny area tucked away somewhere could be supporting the bulk of a whole locality's population of a particular bee species. Now you can imagine how much better we can get at tracking these phenomena with thousands of pairs of eyes compared to just a handful of biologists. Currently, we have a project dedicated specifically to bees of San Diego County, which I co-administrate co with the project founder, Patricia Simpson, who is also um, at the top of the leaderboard. This project has captured 20% of the known bee species in our county, which is extremely impressive in my opinion. Now, I know this is a shameless plug, but I really hope to convince you to take photos of bees and contribute to this project. I also want to mention that for bees, more than for pretty much any other diverse insect group, there's a good chance that any record you upload will be quickly identified by one of the most competent and well-respected taxonomic experts in the world. Now, this is not a shameless plug because it's not me. Uh, it's my good friend, Dr. John Asher, who is a total iNaturalist fanatic. As you can see, he's identified the majority of bee records ever to have been uploaded from North America and actually around the world as well. And every single day, he's identifying both new records and backlogs of old records. Now, Dr. Asher and I are currently working with a few colleagues to figure out how best to analyze iNaturalist data um, for formal scientific inquiries and how to best use this data in monitoring and uh, decision-making and policy. Um, so rest assured that any, effect, uh, any efforts that you put into uh, photographing bees for iNaturalist, your bees will get properly identified to the extent possible from the photos and the data that you help us generate will be put to good use. Another thing you can do is to landscape with native plants. So as you know, urbanization is almost irreversible and human populations will only keep on growing. So we really need to make the best use of the space we already have, even if it's just yards and roadsides. Native plants have co-evolved with um, native bees over millennia. So using them in landscaping efforts will allow you to support not only the very generalized pollinators like honeybees or nectar feeding flies and wasps, but also potentially our much more vulnerable specialist bees as well. As a case study, the Bay Area has lots of bee diversity even in their urban gardens, which is a testament to what years of landscaping with native plants can do for our bees. We have a lot to catch up on um, here in San Diego in this regard. Um, I know it's harder for us because we get a lot less rain than Northern California. Um, and so native plants tend to look 
really sad for much of the year. So I think we need to get more innovative in designing our urban gardens with native plants and also maybe change our expectations of what constitutes a beautiful garden um, in our local landscape. Next, be informed about what save the bees actually means. You may now guess after hearing much of the presentation that most of the time when people say save the bees, they really mean save our managed honeybees used for pollination of crops. Now I'm not anti-honeybee. Um, I actually have a lot of respect for them um, and really enjoy working with the species. And as you can see, there's photographic proof of that. Um, but honeybees have taken not only the lion's share of food resources from our natural landscape, but also really the public's attention, um, funding efforts, both bottom up and top down, and also political clout, um, despite being literally the least threatened bee species in the entire world. Um, we should certainly work on taking good care of the honeybees that are um, entrusted to our beekeepers um, that are pollinating our food, but it really is also extremely important to make sure that conservation efforts are properly targeting our native pollinators. So next time, if your friend asks you to help save the bees, um, you can ask them which bees and then teach them all about our native bees. And lastly, support your local natural reserves and parks like Enza Borrego, Torrey Pines, Cuyamaca Rancho, Cabrillo, just naming a few for the San Diegans uh, among us. Um, as you know, we'll only protect what we love and we'll only love what we know. So please spread the word about the importance of conservation to your friends and family. Um, if you get the chance, take them out, show them how beautiful nature is and especially our bees. And hopefully with these efforts, our grandchildren's grandchildren will have more bees to enjoy than you or I have today. And with that, I'd like to thank the many, many people and entities and funding agencies that have made my research and education efforts possible over the years. And I'd like to thank you for being here today. Um, and I'll be happy to take any questions now. And please don't hesitate to contact me after um, the presentation, after, long after today, if you want, um, with future B questions and my email is there. Uh, so you can reach me anytime. Thanks.